Okay, so let's continue from where we left off. What we have here is we have, if we have an enumerator for L, so let's let E uh, enumerate L. So now what we want is a recognizer for L. So I'm going to be given a string W, and we have to recognize whether W is in L using this enumerator in some way. So let's set it up as we have before on input W. Well, let's see. If W actually is in L, by the definition of a numerator, E will eventually print L. Uh, sorry, will eventually print W. But if W is not in L, then E will never print W. It never prints strings not in the language, for, for the language that it enumerates. So in fact, if it's not in L, then this uh, enumerator will run forever. But that's okay because all we need is that the uh, machine we built be a recognizer. We only need to halt on the strings that are in L. So in fact, what we can do is just start listing members of the language via this enumerator. Just have E print strings repeatedly. And if W is ever found, then that must mean W is in L because E enumerates that language. So uh, repeatedly uh, lists out strings in L using this enumerator E. If any, uh, I should say, if at any point W is listed, except. So at this point we have found out W actually is an L because E told us it was, because it printed it, which means it's an L, which means our recognizer needs to say accept. But if it is not, if E never prints W, then that must mean W cannot possibly be in the language, which means that this will run forever, which is okay because it's a recognizer. So in fact, uh, we just made a recognizer for L, which is nice. Now the other direction. So we have a recognizer, so let's let R recognize L. And what we need here is we need to build an enumerator so a machine that starts off with empty tape and just lists out strings in the language L. So the good thing here is that if we look back to this example right here, we notice that some strings are repeated maybe many times. And in fact, we'll be using that here. So let's start off. So in fact, I shouldn't say on input W, I should say on empty input. If an input is provided, we can just uh, delete the input if we wanted to, but it's actually not necessary. Um, so what we do here is, well, we could just start listing strings out in Sigma star and if R says yes on any of them, on the ones we just list, then we have we print it to the tape for the enumerator to print it. Because the recognizer will tell us which strings are in the language. But as we've seen many times now, if we just run the first string using this recognizer, then the recognizer might run forever. So in fact, we will repeatedly generate some strings for the enumerator uh, using this run in parallel idea we talked about on Monday. So for i equals 0, 1, and etc., we're going to list the first i strings of sigma star, uh, the first i strings of sigma star 
and we're gonna run each of them for I steps. So run the first I strings of sigma star for I transitions, I should say, using R. Okay? So why do we want that? Well, if the recognizer eventually says yes on some string, then for some value of i, we that's the ith string that's uh, in sigma star. Let's say it's value i. Well, it may take fewer than i transitions or more transitions for r to say yes on the, on that string. Well, if it takes more, once we increase i, then the first i strings will include that original string I just referenced. Then at some point for maybe a large value of i, then that string will be accepted by the recognizer. And in fact, if we increase i again, then it'll be accepted again. But that's okay, we can reprint strings on the using the enumerator. So for all uh, such strings accepted by R, uh, print each to the tape. So, in fact, if the recognizer ever accepts a string, then that string will be printed uh, via the enumerator infinitely many times because once you find the value of i for which is accepted and then it's eventually printed, then every value of i after that, it'll also be printed. But that's okay because if you pick any string that is accepted by r, then for some value of i, it will be accepted, which means it'll eventually be printed, which is the definition of enumerator. So in fact, we have shown that uh, both directions. So L is enumerable if and only if L is recognizable. Okay, cool. So one final topic on the why we uh, care about Turing machines. So we talked about these variants and this enumerable to try to bridge the gap between Turing machine world and what we know as computers world. So I referenced this in the first lecture where we had these two folks, Church and Turing, who came up with models of computation equivalent to this notion of Turing machine. And what they have proposed in what is called the Church-Turing thesis is the following notion that uh, what is decided by Turing machines uh, coincides exactly with the notion of algorithms. Okay? So this is not a provable result, and I have a Piazza question in the notes about this. So why is this uh, true but not really a provable statement, or it seems intuitively true? Well, the most fundamental uh, thing that a computer does for in any algorithm is increment. So can an increment be done on a Turing machine? Well, yes, because uh, we actually talked about this on Monday, but we can add integer, add one to an integer in binary. So just as a recap. So to add one to this number, we, uh, as long as we see ones on the right side, we change them to a zero. And then if we ever see one, uh, so, sorry, if we ever see a zero, we change it to a one. If the 
input was all ones, then we put a one on the beginning so that uh, it because it carries over. So in fact, we can do increment on a Turing machine. But if we wanted to add two numbers, then that's just the same thing as saying, as I said on, mon on Monday, it is exactly equal to this, where I, oh no, I did this wrong. X plus one plus Y minus one. And decrement works in a very analogous way. So what we do here is we add one to one number and subtract from the other one until this second number eventually reaches zero. And then once that happens, that is equivalent to uh, the left part being x plus y. So in fact, we can do addition of two numbers. Well, if we wanted to do multiplication, that's just the same thing as repeated addition. If we wanted to do uh, exponentiation, this is just repeated multiplication. So in fact, uh, if you think any reasonable uh, computation that a normal computer can do, a Turing machine can do it because we have these building blocks that we can work with to eventually get to that point. Okay, so that's why the church Turing, so that's why it's called a thesis. It's uh, an intuitively true but not provable statement because we have uh, all of these building blocks we can use to uh, solve uh, a particular problem that we're working on because these are just the essential parts that can build anything else that we need to. Like if we needed cosine or sine or uh, e to some power or compute the log of something, there, there are finite time algorithms to output those things up to a certain precision. So of course we can't write infinitely many things to a tape because that could take infinitely long. So if we want to work with something like that, then we need to cut it off at some point like a normal computer does. Okay. So the church Turing thesis tells us that if we can find something that can't be decided on a Turing machine, then by the church Turing thesis, then there is no algorithm that can solve that problem. So we're going to do exactly that. So we're going to actually show our first undecidable language. And that language is ATM. So the A here stands for acceptance. And we'll be using these A subs some things uh, throughout the entire class. Uh, as well as some other letters that stand for other things. But for now, let's do ATM. And what this is, is a set of encodings. So I'm going to encode a Turing machine and a string W. So just some arbitrary string. And M accepts W. Oops should be this and this will eventually show is not decidable but in fact we can let's just do a warm-up on this one so theorem ATM is in fact recognizable and so now if I'm given this string M that encodes a machine and a string, then I need to say yes when M accepts W. I can run forever if M runs forever on W because it doesn't actually accept W. Okay, so why is this a, a recognizable? So if we are given M and W, 
and we should be explicit here, where m is a tm, w a string. Well, if we just run m on w, then if m actually does accept w at some point, then our simulation then will eventually stop because m will accept w. But that's actually all we need. So run m on w. If m accepts w, we will accept. And in fact, if it rejects w, it just rejects outright, it halts and rejects, then uh, we can either run forever or it just rejects. It actually doesn't matter here because I only need to halt on the strings that are in the language, and we detect that in our simulation. So, uh, and of course, if it runs forever on W, this will run forever on W, which is okay. It's because it's a recognizer. It seems difficult to detect whether or not M will accept W in a finite amount of time because of the issue, well, it may run for a very long time, but it actually doesn't accept W at all. And it seems difficult to be able to check that. Now that's not a proof that this is not decidable. So we'll actually need to actually prove this to actually be convinced that it's not decidable, but that's actually a good intuition because uh, there may be some subtle behavior that we can't detect. Of course, if a machine just continuously moves right, then, that, then of course, that uh, will never stop. But uh, in that case, we could detect it because if we hit the blanks uh, and our instruction says move right, then we must keep doing that. Okay. Actually, that's not quite true, but uh, we can detect it for sure. But we'll actually be able to prove ATM is uh, undecidable. Okay. A common way to go about showing undecidable proofs, we'll see another way which is a lot better, but a common way to approach these is to use a proof by contradiction. So I'm going to say by contradiction here. So what we're going to do here, uh, it's a little bit of a head twisting proof, but the essential idea is note this recognizer here. It took a machine as input, right? So if we actually do in fact have a decider for ATM, then uh, it must be able to answer questions about any arbitrary Turing machine that it could receive, including itself. So the reason for that is because it's a decider, if there is a decider, it must s say the correct answer for any Turing machine that you give it. So that's what we're going to do here. But the great thing is here, Note here, for this accept at the end, it didn't have to be accept. For, uh, for the correctness of showing ATM is recognizable, it has to be accept. But uh, there's nothing barring me from ch uh, changing this to be a reject for a, for a potentially different language. So what, the reason why we want to do that is Note that I said that since it's a decider, it must say the right answer for any Turing machine, including itself. But now we're going to have the machine disagree with itself. And by disagreeing with itself, that's the contradiction that we'll have. And that machine, which we suppose is a decider, is uh, entirely... Uh, only will exist if there is a decider for ATM. But since that's a contradiction, therefore there can't be a decider for ATM. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to suppose that 
Some machine H decides ATM. So ju let's just be absolutely clear what H does. So the way I'm going to write it is this, which means that H on input M and W. So note, H decides ATM supposedly. So it must say either accept or it must say reject at some point. Well, if it says accept, uh, it must say that if uh, M accepts W and reject otherwise. Either it outright rejects W or it runs forever. Okay, so we just have to be sure what H does. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another machine. So there's the entire purpose of this next machine is in the uh, is to uh, assist in the contradiction proof. It has it doesn't really have anything useful other than the contradiction that we'll eventually get. Okay, so I'm going to call this machine D obviously for Jordy. So it will take a machine and nothing else uh, where uh, M is a TM. So the first step is we're going to use H. So we're going to try to run H on something. But note, since it decides ATM, it must take a machine and a string as input. So I've been, I've been given a machine, so that's fine. But I don't have a string yet. But in fact, since we have an encoding of a Turing machine here as a string, that will that's a perfectly valid string that we could use. So what we're going to run H on is that machine coupled with its own description, its own encoding. So this is the machine on the left, and this is the string we'll provide on the right. And as the second step, we'll, uh, whatever H says, because it must halt by assumption, uh, output the opposite or say the opposite of whatever H said. So this is where the disagreeing with yourself comes in. So let's be clear on what D actually does. So it, remember, D takes a single machine and it's pretty clear that D is a decider, assuming H is, because this first step must take a finite amount of time and obviously that st step takes a finite time. So again, we have those two possibilities. So it says except if, well, let's see. If we said except here, then H must have said the opposite thing, which must meant H rejects. Uh, yeah, so H rejects. But if H rejects, then it must be that M rejects uh, its own description because H decides ATM, which is M accepts W. So H must have said the opposite thing. And if we say, if D says reject, then that must mean H said the opposite thing, which must mean uh, M accepts. Oh, one small thing. It should be here does not accept and I'll post I'll have this be a Piazza question so why is it reject there oh, sorry why is it does not accept there instead of reject and we can discuss that on Piazza okay so this is fine the, there doesn't seem to be anything contradictory about this it's D does something with the description of a machine, whatever it does, it does this. So remember, D is a decider. So it must say the correct answer for any Turing machine that is given. But 
in particular, it must say the right answer if we fed D its own description because it needs to say yes for every Turing machine. Well, let's see, let's just fill in the pieces. All we're doing on the left side is we're uh, substituting D for M. Well, this says except if, well, I have two M's here. If D does not accept D. Oh, wait a second. D accepts D if D does not accept D? Well, that seems kind of weird. Let's look at the other one. Well, it says reject if D accepts D. Oh, wait. That seems weird, right? Well, did we make a mistake along the way? Uh, it doesn't seem like we did. We, we're just, uh, we built some machine D and we used H to help us here, but in fact, we derived a contradiction. So by this behavior, D cannot possibly exist because it said the wrong answer for at least one machine, uh, uh, i.e. itself. So it cannot possibly be this, a decider because it can't get the right answer for that machine. But the only reason we were able to build D was because we assumed we can build H. But that must imply that H cannot exist. But wait a second, H was the decider for ATM. And so therefore, since H can't exist, uh, ATM cannot have a decider. Which is uh, sufficient to show that ATM is not decidable. Excellent. So, in fact, we have shown that ATM is a recognizable but undecidable language. As a corollary, what can we say about ATM bar, the complement of ATM? Well, remember from Monday, our result that showed that, so as a thought bubble, that L is decidable if and only if L recognizable and L bar recognizable, right? So what does this tell us? Well, we just showed that ATM is undecidable and we showed that L, it, sorry, we showed that ATM is recognizable, but it can't be the case that ATM bar is recognizable because if it were, then ATM would be decidable, but we just showed it wasn't. So in fact, this is unrecognizable. So in fact, ATM bar is not recognizable. So now we actually have in ex many examples of decidable languages, one example of a language that is uh, recognizable but not decidable, and we have an example of a language that's not even recognizable, which is pretty interesting. But, of course, if we want to show some other languages undecidable, I don't think uh, many of you would like to go through a proof like this all over again. We could, but we, I don't think that would be very productive or enlightening. So think back to this uh, D machine that we had in the proof of ATM undecidable. We used a supposed decider for H to build a supposed decider for D. But if we knew in advance that D was not decidable, then there's no way H could be. Because if H were, then D would be decidable, but we know in advance that it isn't. So this is what is called a reduction. So a reduction is when we have a known undecidable language and 
uh, well, it's an application of this, uh, where we have an undecidable language and we use that to show some other language undecidable. So we needed ATM because we didn't uh, have a undecidable language to work with there. Okay, so a reduction is, so a reduction is a computable, and I'll say what that is in a second, function f from uh, two sets a to b. So uh, another way we can say this is a reduction from a to b. So these can be arbitrary languages. Uh, where uh, w some string is in a if and only if if we apply the reduction uh, on that string w it's also in b so this last bit is very important and why is it important because the answer of whether uh, some string is in a is the same as whether the uh, computed result is in B. So what do I mean by computable here? I mean that a Turing machine can carry out the computation in a finite amount of time. Okay, so as an example, uh, if A is the uh, set of of uh, zeros that is uh, at least uh, so all possible numbers of zeros and what if B is the set of uh, squares and so by this we mean uh, a, a perfect square number of zeros so a reduction then would be to so F of 0 to the I would be uh, zero I squared. So if I take a string W, then uh, right here, let's say, then the computed result is the square of that. So it would be zero, uh, zero to the I, and we do this I times. So that would be an example of a computable function because we can just duplicate uh, zero to the i, i times. So in fact, what we can uh, even do is substitute this zero for a one, and then the computed result is one. Uh, so we substitute a zero for a one. So why would I do that? Well, note that um, the a does not contain any strings uh, that contain the string one and B doesn't contain strings of zeros. So um, if I have a string, let's say uh, zero, uh, sorry, if I have one to the I, then if we define this appropriately, we can make this zero to the I squared. So uh, this string is uh, not in A, but this result is not in B either. This one, first one is in A, this one is, uh, so this should be F of W, sorry. So this should be F of W is in B. So the answer across is the same. So that'll actually be important. So just a quick result. Uh, if uh, B is decidable, then if F A to B is a reduction, and I'll give a shorthand for this in a second, then A is decidable. Uh, a way of writing this is to say A less than or equal to B. So it's a function that starts off in A and ends in B. It's not my notation. It's, uh, I don't like the notation either, but it's what we're stuck with. So why is this true? Well, if we're given a string in A, 
Oh, uh, yeah. So if we're given a string w, then what we can do is compute f of w because it's a computable function where I can actually do the computation. Then since b is decidable, then what we can do is test whether f of w actually is in b. If so, because the answer is the same for a as it is was for b, then it must be the case that w was in a before. So then we say accept. If not, since the answer is the same, then we must reject. But each step along the way takes a finite amount of time, so therefore we have a decider. As a corollary, so this is so that first one we don't really use that much, but a corollary is if A is undecidable and uh, A less than or equal to B, then B is undecidable. And why is this true? Because uh, this is just the contrapositive of the theorem we just shown, and so is equivalent to the uh, theorem. And so this actually opens up a whole new door for showing problems to be undecidable. So let's do one of them. So we're going to show that, and not ATM now, we're going to show ETM, which is just a single machine, uh, where the language of this machine is empty. So in fact, the machine that you're given uh, doesn't actually accept anything. It may take a long time to eventually reject something or run forever, but it actually does not accept anything. But we'll show that this is undecidable. So. The way we go about proving this is we show that ATM uh, reduces to ATM. So that's another way to say it. ATM reduces to ETM. So we're going to use a supposed decider for ETM to make a supposed decider for ATM. But we know the supposed decider for ATM cannot possibly exist, so therefore no decider for ETM can exist. So let's suppose E decides ETM. So to make a decider for ATM, so remember ATM must take a machine and a string as input because that's what ATM's language is all about. Well, I can't feed M, well, I could feed M directly to E, but that wouldn't tell me anything at all uh, about whether M accepts W. Well, if E says, yes, M's language is empty, then yeah, definitely M does not accept W. But if E says, no, M's language is not empty, that tells me nothing about whether M accepts W or not. So we can't do that directly. So what should we do instead? Well, what we can do then instead is we'll make another machine that has empty language if and only if M accepts W. So we're going to construct a TM let's call it M prime, and this machine is going to take arbitrary input. Well, let's call it X. Okay. So this first step of M prime is going to seem a little controversial, but I'll explain why we're going to do this. We're going to run M on W. The reason why we do this is if um, M actually does accept W, we will want to accept X. So if M accepts W, then we'll accept the input of M prime, which is X in this case. 
So let's think about what this m prime actually does. Well, once we get to here, m and w are fixed. So either m accepts w or rejects w or runs forever on w, or just simply accepts or does not accept. Well, if m does accept w, well, no matter what, what x I'm given, this if test will always be true because it doesn't involve x at all. So I will always accept x if m accepts w. So if m accepts w, then I m prime accepts every single x, which means L of m prime is sigma star. It accepts everything. Well, if m does not accept w, then let's see. Well, this if test will never be true because m does not accept w. So I'll never accept any x. So m prime doesn't accept anything, so it's empty. And so now, using the supposed decider for etm, we'll run this supposed decider e on the input m prime. And so why was this step controversial? Well, it seems like m could run forever on w, which is definitely true. However, I'm only building m prime. I'm not actually running m prime. I'm using the supposed decider to, uh, to tell me which, uh, whether or not m prime is empty. But we know from the construction of m prime that these two are the only possibilities. It could either be empty or it could be sigma star. So let's see. If E accepts, meaning that E actually says, yeah, M prime's language actually is empty. Well, that must mean we're in this case right here, which means M does not accept W because that's the only way that that could have happened. So for our supposed decider for ATM, we need to say reject because M does not accept W. And if E rejects, it says, no, your language is not empty. Well, it must be that we're in this first case, but that must mean M must accept W because that's the only way that that could have happened. So therefore we must accept. But from this, we know ATM is undecidable. So uh, ETM must be. Okay, so we're doing a reduction here just to recap. The reduction is, well, if M, the reduction here uh, spelled out is uh, we take uh, m and w as input, and the function returns the description of m prime. It computes this uh, Turing machine m prime. And the answer in this case happened to be the opposite, which is okay because we can flip the answer since we're trying to work with a decider. Okay. But since it's undecidable, etm must be. Great. Let's, let's see how much time. So I'm going to stop here and then we'll continue with more reductions after that.